If you're looking at the title of the video and you think you already know what I'm going to say, then I encourage you to stick around because you might be surprised. I actually had a different uh, idea for a video prepared for this month, and I certainly don't plan to be one of those channels that covers every topic when it's topical. But there's been a recent trend on the internet lately. There have been some stirrings uh, about a particular movie that uh, has come out recently, and I just wanted to make it known my stance on the discourse about this extremely and rightfully controversial film. I'm, of course, referring to the Barbie movie. I hope you enjoyed that moment of levity, listener, because it's the last one that you're probably going to get for the rest of this video. No, I'm talking about Oppenheimer. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about a certain segment of the online discourse that has come up about this movie. Now, I am a leftist leftist. I think this is the first time I've ever just directly come out and said that in any of these videos, but I imagine a lot of you could probably gather that from a lot of my statements. And I'm not saying this because I want to focus on my politics. I am saying this because by the time this video is over, I think a lot of people who listened are going to doubt that fact. I'm not a Marxist, uh, which is not because I have any particular animosity toward Marx. I just uh, do not subscribe to a Marxist dialectic or a lot of things that Orthodox Marxists believe. My type of leftism is more in line with a lot of American leftist traditions, labor unionism, um, Debs, La Follette. FDR, people like that, um, and then uh, David Ricardo, uh, John Stuart Mill, and a uh, Christian socialism and um, Catholic social justice teaching. Not that I'm a particularly devout Christian or particularly devout Catholic. I actually have some very uh, liberal and um, accepting views when it comes to issues of a lot of issues of personal morality lgbtq rights uh women's liberation women's bodily autonomy stuff like that but in, you know in general that's where my my thoughts uh come from and um you know unlike a, a lot of uh people who subscribe to more marxist ideologies i, I don't believe that every single institution um, that exists in current society was set up explicitly for the purposes of exploitation and, and capitalist exploitation. Uh, bringing that up for a reason, we'll get back around to that. I was what you might call an early adopter of the Bernie Sanders political movement, and from 2017 up until basically last year, I was an active campaigner um, for a number of left-wing politicians going out and convincing voters that uh, these people's ideas aligned with, with, with what they saw in their own lives. But uh, within the last year or so, I have asked myself more and more whether a lot of these folks who we got elected uh, for the first time in the big progressive wave at the end of the 2010s, uh, whether or not they were always disingenuous or had the wrong um, perspective on things or whether they're just selling out now because it's the easy path. I'm that kind of leftist. But also, I grew up uh, a self-identified conservative, and I was a foot soldier for the Republican Party um, from the lowest levels to some of the highest levels uh, throughout my 20s. Um, to be clear, I was a young white man uh, living in one of the regions of the country, which, I mean, might as well have been bombed out for all the damage that was done to it uh, by the economy, in a, a downwardly mobile uh, family, searching for answers for why things were the way they were. Um, so I was in the exact core target audience uh, for the types of messages that are being pushed by conservatives or were being pushed by conservatives even back then. So I mistakenly believed that conservatism and conservative ideology in the Republican Party um, aligned with a lot of the beliefs that I had about um, you know, being the party of, of the working class and, and um, of helping out the little guy in the party of opportunity. This isn't uh, this is an explanation, it's not an excuse. Uh, 
But because of that background, I got to see firsthand, again, at all, at all levels, um, why oftentimes conservative arguments um, are so persuasive to people who, on the face of it, shouldn't agree with them, and how conservatives go about constructing those arguments, but also why uh, liberal arguments and why uh, some left-wing and leftist arguments oftentimes go over so poorly with, with a lot of those same people. Liberals and even a lot of sincere leftists are oftentimes very reactive with their politics. And so they take the bait that conservatives intentionally lay out to just sort of attack whatever conservatives claim to be for rather than trying to construct their own arguments and to undermine conservative claims to be in favor of cultural institutions that people are generally uh, favorable towards. And so, you know, rather than undermining conservative claims to be for the family or for communities or a private initiative and individuality, they end up taking stances that come off to um, many folks who should be in their core target audience as very defensive or, or hostile towards those institutions, rather than taking the opportunity to build off the strengths of their own positions towards those institutions and working to reaffirm the humanity the basic humanity of everybody and find common cause with a lot of these folks who, again, should be in their target audience. So that brings me back to the main point of this video, which is the political discourse around Oppenheimer and whether or not it appropriately portrays the Japanese point of view of the events that are that are laid out in the film and um a number of historical takes that are out there right now on the internet that are floating around that uh, try to demonize the film for for not portraying the japanese point of view and rely back on this narrative of the victimization of japan during world war ii now, I want to state something up front. I am all for portrayals that, that humanize the, the strife and the plight of the average Japanese citizen and even Japanese soldiers and about asking some very serious moral questions uh, about the ethics of of the use of nuclear weapons against Japan and what the consequences of that were and the effects that, that had on the people who became victims of the bomb. I am not for dehumanizing anyone um, fully. I, I think that, that everyone is entitled to a basic standard of humanity and of portraying the humanity of our enemies, our foes, and even of very evil people, because portraying, you know, trying to take a look at the humanity of even very evil people at least gives you some insight into why people who do awful things, what goes into their decision-making process and, and how they became the way they were so that we can avoid repeating mistakes of the past. And for the most part, I think that the movie tackles some of these issues rather well. Um, it, it does deal with the the ethics of the use of the nuclear bomb. It, it does deal with the aftermath of that. It, it does struggle with a lot of these these real decisions that happen, the consequences of these decisions. And also with some of the narratives that have come out um, since, you know, you have a lot of foreign policy realists who will come out and they will say that, uh, well, you know, the, the use, the uh, development and the use of nuclear weapons is a good thing, actually, because it's um, it prevented 
large-scale wars between major powers and probably actually save lives. So that's a real take that's out there. You can read it in a lot of foreign policy journals. It was um, especially uh, uh, potent during the 1990s. But, you know, that ignores a lot of the proxy wars that were fought between the superpowers during the Cold War that resulted in millions and millions of deaths in the developing and, and impoverished world. So I'm interjecting this in post. Uh, after I recorded this segment, I watched Ben Shapiro's awful review of the Oppenheimer film. And uh, he basically lays out the exact argument that I just mentioned. So it is a live take that is out there right now. Back to the main recording. I would also say that the existence of nuclear weapons and the conditions during the Cold War led to the growth and development of the power of the state in all of the worst ways. And so I am definitely not here to defend the existence of nuclear weapons. And I don't think the movie is either. Uh, I think the movie portrays the existence of nuclear arsenals as, as rather a bad thing. Rather, I'm here specifically to talk about the narratives um, that have come out as a reaction to the film uh, that are intended to portray Japanese victimization and also lambast the film for not appropriately portraying these narratives. But I also want to talk about why this exists in the discourse at all, uh, where these narratives come from, how they got started, why this is a thing that we now have to deal with, um, and, and why it has any political power at all. I also understand that a lot of the uh, backlash, uh, especially on Twitter, is more geared towards the Barbenheimer phenomenon, um, which you know, feels like a much uh, more appropriate criticism to me um, when viewed from the Japanese perspective. But it, this whole thing has opened the door to a, a lot of conversation about these uh, Japanese victimization narratives and so, you know, that's, again, that's going to be the main thing I'm going to be focused on. So this is Confrontational Histories, the YouTube series that uh, tackle was bad historical takes and narratives. Please like, subscribe, comment if you have any thoughts about the videos, and uh, let's get started. So let's talk about tankies. Now, a number of you probably rolled your eyes just now and had some terrible traumatic flashbacks to some moments that you had debating uh, this specific type of individual. For many of you, this is the first time that you have heard this term, or perhaps you've heard it before and you're not familiar with what it means. A tanky is a type of person who exists in leftist spaces, uh, mainly on internet forums, but you will find them out in the real world from time to time, who is extremely critical of the past actions and oftentimes current actions of the West broadly and the U.S. in particular. Now, there's a lot out there to criticize about Western colonialism and imperialism and about the current institutions and the past of the United States in particular, and, and how conventional histories tend to cover up a lot of those realities. Just check out a lot of my other videos if you want to hear about that. Um, however, these folks tend to take it a step further than that, and they portray anyone who is opposed to the U.S. as the good guys. And so because of this, oftentimes they side with the Soviet Union, uh, with the People's Republic of China, uh, with any past enemies uh, of the United States, um, and they hold up figures such as Stalin, uh, Mao, and even currently Vladimir Putin as, as though they're heroes. Uh, the Nazis are largely exempt from this, but in order to justify their beliefs, uh, the Allied leaders essentially need to be presented as though they were as bad as Hitler. In their narratives, um, FDR becomes a monster because of Japanese internment and various other actions. 
Um, Churchill is seen as being personally responsible for the Bengali famine uh, rather than the responsibility lying at the feet of a century of bad British colonial policy that was created with the intent to ensure that no region of the British Empire could be self-sufficient if it was cut off from the whole. And of course, to the point of this video, Japan becomes a victim of Western aggression. Now, I'm not making any apologies here for the bad actions of allied leaders and certainly um, of ally, uh, United States, at rather, and Western leaders um, after the Second World War. But I think it goes pretty far to say that Japanese internment was on par with the Holocaust or that uh, Churchill was a genocider on the same level as Hitler. And the claim that Japan was the victim of Western aggression against uh, concrete facts that were known at the time and are known today and are available in the public sphere. Indeed, it was knowledge of Japanese atrocities and, and Japan's imperialist war against China that led FDR to signed the embargo against Japan, which then led to the Japanese attacking the United States uh, and our other allies. Now, as with all narratives, the tanky narrative has its origin points. And so, as is portrayed in the film Oppenheimer, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, a lot of Americans who had sort of vaguely leftist sympathies uh, became members of a variety of different uh, left-wing political organizations. One of these was the Communist Party. As I had talked about in my American politics videos, neither major political party during the 1920s uh, had any significant left representation. And so if folks wanted anything um, outside of the standard centrist and conservative politics, uh, especially in the wake of the first Red Scare, they had to go to one of these groups. And so a lot of folks who were involved in these were not all that fringe at all, and uh, included a number of fairly high-profile people, or people that we see as fairly high-profile today, um, Oppenheimer, but also a Lucille Ball as an example of another person. And a lot of these folks who were fairly idealistic in their their mindset believed a lot of the lies that were coming out of the Soviet Union about what was happening there and portrayed things as being much better than they actually were. And uh, of course, the Depression hit, and be even before the Depression in the 1920s, things in the United States weren't great for a lot of people. But the Depression hit, and for a while, no one was really doing anything about it, and so a lot of people who wanted some sort of change were attracted to these uh, organizations. But then FDR came along, and a lot of these folks saw what they wanted in the New Deal. Uh, a lot of the lies about the Soviet Union were being exposed. And also, a lot of people who were involved in a lot of uh, these leftist organizations, and the Communist Party in particular, started getting somewhat disillusioned with the anti-democratic, uh, pro-Moscow uh, bent of a lot of these organizations. Even amongst those who continued to toe the Moscow line, a lot of them left in the 1950s when the Soviet Union was responsible for a lot of imperialist violence against Eastern European countries um, in Czechoslovakia and East Germany. And then in Hungary, when a new government came to power, which was still socialist, they just wanted a different type of more democratic socialism um, compared to the Soviet Union. And the Soviets sent in the tanks to crush it. A lot of people in the Communist Party were disgusted by this, but some uh, continued to defend Moscow. And then they were given the moniker tankies by other leftists. So that's where that comes from. But a number of these narratives that were pushed out by the tankies uh, came to prominence again in the 1960s with the emergence of the New Left and uh, were embraced by some people within the New Left. Uh, the New Left was a reaction um, against America's traditionalist civil rights policies, its traditional policies on um, family matters and women's rights and any number of things. But mainly it was a movement against the Vietnam War.
And so uh, a lot of folks did have some justifiable criticisms of United States policy at that time. But uh, a lot of folks also adopted this sort of tanky mentality that uh, the United States was always the bad guy regardless of what they did. But, I mean, these folks are fairly isolated politically in and amongst themselves, and so what they had to say wouldn't have any power, but for the fact that a number of otherwise fairly standard liberals who have none of the uh, pretense that the tankies have towards any type of interest or desire in class politics or class solidarity have also taken up a lot of these narratives as part of their new left identity. Um, I will at some point do some videos about the new left. I have rather mixed opinions about it, but um, aside from just being factually inaccurate and, of course, helping cover up a lot of the atrocities that were committed by the, the uh, Japanese Imperial Army um, as, as part of this narrative, um, I think that these narratives that are pushed by, by these individuals, they also help the right um, by taking these stances really in two ways. Um, first, you know, such blind extremism and commitment to all, seeing all of these uh, terrible regimes as being heroic uh, really alienates a lot of average people. But second, the narrative of Japanese victimization was specifically fashioned by the Japanese and has been used as a national myth to suppress any attempt to use Japanese past as a way to attack the elite within that country. People who have tried to address Japan's past have often seen their social, professional, and actual lives ended for doing so, and it remains a major matter of controversy up until this day. But uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. I'd just like to conclude this portion by saying that I wish a lot of these folks would just read a book. Specifically this book, uh, The Rape of Nanking. Uh, this is a book by Iris Chang, who was a Chinese-American. Um, she studied Japanese atrocities um, for making this book, but also in some of her other works. She also did some uh, works that were fairly critical of America's legacy, um, of racism, and so she wasn't, uh, she was not a, uh, a patriotic history person by any stretch of the imagination. Her work in this field helped bring the light, uh, again, as I said, a lot of these things were well known in the, the 30s and 40s, but helped bring back into the public consciousness a number of the atrocities, horrible acts of brutality um, that were committed by the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, not just in, in Nanjing, but also in the Philippines, uh, the Bhutan Death March, uh, pretty much anywhere that the Japanese Imperial Army went, there were horrible, horrendous atrocities that were committed. And uh, her work in this field, unfortunately, probably eventually uh, led to her doing something to herself that I can't mention because of YouTube's content guidelines. Now, I'm kind of caught here between the trap of not wanting to be too gratuitous, but also not wanting to um, fall into uh, the old Stalin quote about how one death is a tragedy, uh, a million deaths is a statistic. But uh, all in all, the Japanese Imperial Army and Navy are believed to have conservatively been responsible for about 10 million civilian deaths between 1937 and 1945, um, and perhaps as many as 30 million. Now, um, a death is a death is a death. But a lot of these killings were not the type of nighttime flyovers of uh, industrial and strategic bombing that the Allies were committed to. Um, a lot of these killings were, were deeply personal, um, literally sexually assaulting women to death, um, sh ma mass shootings of prisoners, uh, beheading POWs, going into Chinese and Philippine villages and, and just cleaning them out um, on the orders of the officers, uh, 
taking civilians out and using them as target practice or bayonet practice. Uh, the list really goes on and on and on. It's comparable to any of the Nazi atrocities that were committed during the war. Even amongst those who weren't killed, there were a number of victims. Uh, you may have heard of a lot of the Korean women who are euphemistically referred to as comfort women, um, who have long petitioned those who are still alive. There aren't many who are left, but who uh, have long petitioned the Japanese government for some sort of formal apology. And then, of course, you can look at the atrocities that the Japanese government committed against Japanese civilians. Again, there are many instances here um, that I could just sort of point out en masse, but I'll, I'll focus on one. When the United States invaded Saipan, which was the first island in the Pacific War that had a significant civilian population, uh, the Japanese Imperial Army just demonstrated flagrant disregard for the well-being of their own citizens. The civilian protection bunkers that they had set up were indistinguishable from military bunkers uh, on purpose. So that way the United States Army would waste time and resources targeting them as well. Um, they had convinced the population of the island that if they surrendered, terrible things would happen to them. And so a number of folks uh, S-worded themselves instead of... Uh, living under American uh, military rule. Almost by happenstance, there was a Marine Corps private uh, who was part of the invasion force uh, named Guy Gabaldon, who had been adopted by and raised by a Japanese family uh, in the United States. And he was able to convince almost 1,500, I believe, Japanese civilians out of fighting to the death and or um, S-wording themselves but for the most part, most of the Japanese civilians on the island died because of the propaganda they had been fed by the Japanese government, which was part of a deliberate effort by the Japanese Imperial Army to create as much chaos and confusion as possible for the invading Allied forces. As a side note, um, Gabaldon was awarded the Navy Cross, which is the second highest award uh, given by the United States Navy specifically for these actions and is currently being considered for the Congressional Medal of Honor. But if the existence of these narratives came down only to uh, their origin with the the tankies uh, and, uh, and other people who sort of affiliated with uh, tanky foreign policy narratives, they wouldn't have had a lot of traction. Certainly, at least in the West, you can blame part of the problem for uh, the disappearance of uh, the conversation about Japanese atrocities on the conditions of the Cold War. Um, when the Korean War went hot, um, China was our enemy and Japan was our ally. And so a lot of this stuff just did not get the same focus as the uh, Nazi atrocities did after the war. But if you want to talk about a narrative of Japanese victimization, it is out there. It's just that the Japanese civilian population were victims of their own government, their own military, their own elite. And so why was it that after the war, these folks weren't blamed by the Japanese populace? Well... After the war, Japanese conservatives launched a focused, intentional, and concerted effort within their own country, but then also abroad, to portray themselves as being victims of Western aggression, to bury all aspects of the Japanese experience during the war, except for those that cast the uh, hierarchy of Japan in the best possible light and focus only on the atomic bombings. But to get there, first we have to go back a little bit um, and talk about the Japanese perspective, or at least the perspective of the Japanese government prior to World War II. Japan was an emerging power at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in 1904, they defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, this war was fought over essentially colonial rights rights. 
specifically to Korea, but later these rights expanded into, uh, from the Japanese perspective anyway, colonial rights over vast areas of China. The Japanese weren't the only ones in this game of uh, colonial rights over China, obviously. A lot of Western powers had enforced their will um, on the Chinese populace, especially in the 19th century. But uh, as part of sort of the continuity for this, Japan joined the side of the Entente, or you know, the Allies, if you will, in World War I. They didn't really do a whole lot. Uh, they captured some German islands, but that was about it. They didn't send any forces to the Western Front or you know, through Russia to help fight on the Eastern Front. They just kind of sat on some German islands uh, throughout the entirety of the war. But their expectations for what they were going to get after the war were fairly high. They expected to be able to lay vast territorial claims because of their part in the war. And they didn't really get much at Versailles. And so the Japanese felt that they had been disrespected. So even then, before anything had really happened, the Japanese were already starting to build this narrative within their society that they were the victims of Western aggression, this vast Western plot to keep them from expanding their colonial empire as the Western powers had done, and this uh, vast plot to keep them down and keep them from growing their own economy. Now, certainly there were a number of strategic defensive measures that were taken by against the Japanese by European powers and the United States uh, who had interests in the Pacific Ocean and did, in fact, fear Japanese expansion and Japanese aggression. However, a number of Western um, industrialists and financiers actually took an interest in the growth of the Japanese economy. At this time, the Japanese economy was completely controlled by the Zabatsu. Um, they were these uh, large, essentially sort of crown corporations um, for a Western equivalent that had been created by the Japanese government to empower a very small number of Japanese elite families to run vast sectors of the economy. And um, the, the Zaibatsu were basically trusts, as we would think of them. They controlled every element of their own production from top down and made dealing within the Japanese economy very easy for outsiders because they could just go to one of these powerful families. Um, Japanese production was able to undercut a lot of Western labor and Western production um, in a preview of what would happen later. Um, but they were able to undercut a lot of um, uh, Western labor and Western production. And so um, a lot of Western industrialists found this quite useful. Uh, they could import goods from Japan and use that as sort of a, a means of, of undercutting their own workforce. For this reason, a lot of American industrialists and financiers actually felt very comfortable dealing with uh, the Japanese and and contributing to the growth of their economy. As just one example of this, the uh, famous Japanese fighter plane, the Zero, was designed by Howard Hughes and sold directly to the Japanese government. And so when Franklin Delano Roosevelt launched his embargo against Japan over their imperialist actions in China, there was a real imperative there to stop Western business cooperation with the Japanese war machine. I'm not just saying this to set the scene, but also because this narrative is still taught in Japan without teaching the consequences of what happened as a result of the Japanese populace believing in, in this narrative. As is a common theme in a lot of my videos, where you start your narrative and what details you choose to leave out, even if you are expressing some basic facts with your narrative, uh, is very important in terms of shaping how people view things. Now, immediately after the end of the war, there was some effort within Japanese culture to deal appropriately with, with what had just happened, with, with um, the militarism of Japanese society and, and the war crimes. But this was relatively short-lived. Um, a number of prominent 
a Japanese official was um, in the Zaibatsu, but also people who were in the government who had cooperated very heavily with the Zaibatsu and authorized a lot of these crimes, they came back into the Japanese government. Uh, these, a lot of these folks at some point or another had been held as Class A war criminals. Class A is the highest level of war criminal that's out there. Had Hitler and Mussolini had been captured alive, they would have been deemed Class A war criminals. However, as I said, there was some effort uh, at a transition, a more peaceful and, and leftward-leaning transition in the immediate aftermath of the war. A really good example of this effort to deal with it came in the form of the films of Akira Kurosawa. If you've never had an opportunity to see any of Kurosawa's films, I would highly recommend that you take a look at some of them. Uh, they're good films on their own. Um, they deal with a lot of universal themes of morality, but also the, the heroes in Kurosawa's films generally are anti-authority. They're anti-establishment. Um, they're moving against the conservative traditions of Japanese culture, or at least somewhat standing athwart those traditions. And while a lot of Kurosawa's films do harken back to a sort of a, a what you call a simpler time in Japanese culture, so there is a, a tinge of reactionary element to them, they contain a lot of themes that are directly juxtaposed to the societal norms that had been enforced by the Japanese elite prior to the Second World War. And so in this way, they're directly comparable to a lot of American Western films, which is understandable because uh, a lot of the themes are sort of borrowed from early American Western films, but then a number of American Western films that were made in the 1960s and 70s are basically almost direct ripoffs of Kurosawa's films. They were the first major post-war cultural export of Japan, and they had a lot of influence over later Western media that came about. But interestingly, Kurosawa's films tended to not be that popular within Japan itself. And that's because by the time that uh, Kurosawa was in his peak, which is to say the late 50s um, and very early 1960s, there was already a strong conservative cultural backlash building within Japan to reassert the power of Japanese elites um, and also a number of Japanese cultural norms, but minus the militaristic overtones, or at least I should say the expansionist militaristic overtones. In 1955, the government of Japan gave exclusive rights to print textbooks, to private companies, many of whom were run by individuals who had profited off of the prior military buildup of Japan leading up to World War II. And so while a number of Japanese textbooks uh, prior to 1955 had dealt more honestly with what had happened during the war, mentions of atrocities, mentions of Japanese uh, expansion, uh, mentions of aggressive Japanese uh, military footing basically were eliminated from textbooks after that because they made the people writing the textbooks look bad. And of course, the government had done this knowing that they were handing the reins over to people who would be favorable to them, to their friends, to their financial backers. This cultural backlash in Japan, this conservative cultural backlash, culminated in the assassination of Socialist Party leader Injuro Asunoma um, by a right-wing nationalist uh, named Atoya Yamaguchi and a wave of political assassinations and political violence that was inspired by what Yamaguchi had done. Um, Yamaguchi to this day is held up as an inspiration and an idol to many people in Japanese conservative and far-right circles. And so not unlike in Germany with the clean Wehrmacht myth, Japanese narratives about the past and, and its history, written in a way intended to essentially defend the economic and cultural elites in society who were still in power, had lived through the war, and were still in power after the war. And, and not unlike 
in Germany, while the United States was not directly involved in this, it, it certainly didn't do anything to stop it because, again, the, the thinking was, well, the needs of fighting the Cold War are more important now. While many of the Zabatsu were broken up in the wake of the war in order to allow for a more free market environment, a lot of them just reemerged into the Kiryatsu, which were essentially cartels, large business cartels that um, essentially ran the Japanese economy um, and in a lot of ways ran the Japanese government. These things were, were hand in hand with each other. Um, a lot of the politicians that came out of the Liberal Democratic Party, which is the conservative party that is dominant in Japanese politics, a lot of them came out of these kiratsu and they were very closely tied to them, or, or um, as was the case with uh, Shinzo Abe, were directly descended from a lot of these people who were held as class one war criminals after the war was over. Just to backtrack for a moment, the relationship between the Zabatsu and the Kiratsu was not unlike when the United States broke up Standard Oil, and that uh, you know they they essentially broke up the holdings of the Rockefeller family into forty three different companies, which the Rockefeller family also mostly controlled. So that's kind of the uh, the full extent of the power shift that had supposedly happened after the war. So while the Japanese government in the late 40s and early 50s was about reconciliation and they were interested in trying to address the problems of the past, almost immediately into the 1960s and 70s, Japan began rescinding the apologies that it had made and started rewriting the histories of what had happened. This is where you get the fairly common Japanese saying, which is parodied by other Asian nations, especially Korea, that, well, the Koreans were the victim of the bomb, too. And that's not unlike saying that uh, enslaved folks here in the United States who were on the farms that were raided by the Union Army were also victims of the Union Army, which, again, is a narrative that actually exists in some neo-Confederate circles. But we're talking about basically the same sort of thing here. So you get this atmosphere in Japanese culture of denialism from the elites and total silence on the atrocities of the past when it comes to the Japanese education system. Entire generations of folks in Japan grew up believing that Japan had been the victim of Western plots against them before the war, were victims of Western aggression during the war, and then had the atomic bombs dropped on them, and that was about all they learned about it. Uh, you can go on YouTube, just type in uh, Why I Hate America um, on Japanese channels, and you'll find all kinds of people spouting out this nonsense, and about the best you're going to get are some videos of people who advocate for the more liberalized Japanese narrative, which is that Japan was the sacrifice to nuclear holocaust so that the rest of the world wouldn't have to be. And just to say again, I, I don't want to dismiss these perspectives outright. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more on them later, but I, I do believe that this stuff is, is worth talking about. Also, I feel the need to add this in. Do not go to any of these channels and start leaving nasty comments. I disavow any of that type of behavior, and if you do that, I disavow you. So I just want to be clear on that as well. A number of the folks in these channels are people who are clearly struggling with the negative history of their past and their culture and their society. And boy, should we be able to identify with that as Americans or as Canadians or as Brits or whoever's listening to this channel. And I also want to say that not everyone in Japan is on board with the narratives that, that dismiss Japanese war crimes. Um, as late as 1972, the uh, Asai Shimbun, which is a, a liberal newspaper in Japan, liberal left-leaning newspaper, uh, printed an entire expose on Japanese war crimes. But 
they made themselves a target by doing that. Uh, there were a number of acts of violence and threats against their offices, people who carried their newspaper as a result of them trying to bring this stuff to light for the Japanese public. Now, moving on to the next topic, um, in light of what I described about the Kiratsu, in light of this, um, the knowledge of the way that the Japanese economy was organized, the large cartels that uh, ran Japanese economy and Japanese society, essentially, and the influence that they had over the government, that then gets us to kawaii culture. Uh, kawaii culture, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the culture of cuteness or helplessness that is either so beloved or so loathsome to a lot of Westerners that has come out of Japan. Um, started really with Hello Kitty, but uh, kind of took off after that. You can see these sort of symbols everywhere in Japanese culture and uh, in a lot of uh, fans of Japanese culture today. This kawaii culture of cuteness and of helplessness was a deliberative attempt by... Japanese economic, social, and government leaders to rebrand Japan internationally after the war was over, um, to soften Japan's image to the world and also internally, and invalidate or uh, deem incredible uh, claims of Japan's past to, in order to help out its, its financial and market interests. Now, I just want to be clear, I'm not saying that if you're a fan of kawaii culture, that means that you're aiding and abetting fascism. I'm just saying that a lot of this stems from Japan's attempts to whitewash its own history. The extremely close relationship between the Japanese government and the Kiretsu had consequences that both go along to further the topic that we're talking about now, but also had profound lasting impacts on Japanese life. As a lot of people are aware, Japan, while it still remains the world's third largest economy and is quite economically competitive, uh, suffered a very severe economic downturn in the 1990s that, that has lasting impacts into this day. And a lot of that was caused and created by this relationship that the, the two entities, the government and the Kiretsu, had with each other. The hyper-capitalist economy of Japan in the 1970s and the 80s was fueled largely by this cooperation, uh, so much so that the Japanese government, the, the, the reigning uh, Liberal Democrat Party, as I said, which was the Conservative Party, uh, was directly robbing, essentially, from the savings of the Japanese populace in order to fuel uh, this, this, this economic miracle, as it was seen at the time. Uh, Japan did not have an adequate retirement system, um, unlike, well, a lot of Western countries used to have adequate retirement systems, but, say, unlike Social Security. Um, a lot of the banks, the larger banks, were directly controlled by the Kiretsu, and so their only interest was in finance capital. It was not a safe environment for average Japanese uh, civilians and citizens to put their money into. So a lot of them relied on postal banking. Uh, we used to have postal banking here in the United States as well. You put your small amounts of money into the post office for a small return on interest, and um, that's, that's where a lot of people who didn't have a lot of money were putting their savings. Well, the Japanese government was taking that money and directly putting it into the kiratsu, into, um, into Japanese uh, corporate finance interests. And this uh, caused a bubble that collapsed in 1991 and caused conditions in Japan that aren't unlike what we're experiencing here today in the West. They just got there faster than we did. 
um, and it, not unlike here in the West, um, there were some minor reforms, but by and large, the people who were responsible for this collapse did not face any consequences for it. The reigning uh, Liberal Democrat Party was only out of power for about a year after the next election was held, and then they got right back into power and have more or less been controlling things uh, ever since. They didn't face any electoral consequences even for this. But as long periods of economic downturn tend to do, um, this downturn in Japan's economy, this downturn, uh, this uh, disintegration of Japanese social life has sparked a renewed interest in ultranationalist themes in Japan. And even going further than denialist narratives of Japanese war crimes, there's been an increase interest in Japanese remilitarization and an unhealthy fetishization of Japan's imperial past. Now, there are new emerging leftist and liberal currents that have um, sprouted up in opposition to this, uh, this, as I said, unhealthy fetishization of Japan's past. And Japan today is going through something of a culture war that's very similar to the culture wars that are going on in Western countries right now, but also not unlike in a lot of Western countries, uh, conservative forces as a reaction to this um, new leftist and liberal current have doubled down on a lot of these narratives of victimization. Um, Shinzo Abe's term as prime minister of Japan is notable for how flagrantly his government acted to suppress a lot of honest narratives about Japan's past when they spouted up in the education system, in the public sphere, and uh, in the media. And so that's where Japan sits right now, sits today. And I can hear some people who are watching this who are saying, well, how dare you? Even you directly compared this to what's going on in the West. You see, the West is bad. The West is, is just as bad. How dare you condemn the Japanese populace? And I'm not condemning the Japanese populace. My point is that this is exactly like the type of stuff that goes on in the West with the suppression of history. It's just going on in a different different environment, a different culture, a different country. And if you're going to be against it here in the West, then you got to be against this stuff when it sprouts up in other places as well. It all comes from the same unhealthy place. It all comes from these attempts to institute cultural control. And so if you're going to be against this, you got to be against all of it. You can't just be against it when it's America. And you should, certainly shouldn't be looking at this the 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 one period in history where you can say that America and the Western powers were acting decisively against an aggressive colonialist power um, in Japan or even oftentimes in the Soviet Union. I mean, I, again, the, the the Western security culture did a lot of awful things internally and externally during the Cold War, but these these forces that were out there were doing things that were just as bad as what the West was doing. So don't fetishize them. Don't, don't make excuses for them. You have to see the whole picture. You can't just be contrarian to the forces within your own culture. You have to, again, be against all of it. And so just as sort of a conclusion here, talk about the Japanese victims of the bomb talk about these topics. And I believe that the movie Oppenheimer does cover these topics very well. I don't think it's trying to erase this conversation at all. If you actually go out and watch the movie, these themes are covered in the film. You know, the, the, the talk about the, the morality of, of the bomb and of nuclear arms. That's an important conversation. But narratives of Japanese victimization at the hands of Western aggression, it's just more covering for evil so that you can say that America was bad. So please stop doing it. Anyway, um, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe. This one was kind of put together. Um, as I said, it wasn't the original topic that I had intended to cover.
uh, for this month. So I kind of put this together in, in sort of a piecemeal kind of way. But I, I thought it was important to talk about given what's what's floating around out there on the internet right now. So um, if you listen to this and you sense any sloppiness on my part, it's there, you know, and, and I'm sorry about uh, any places where I may have overgeneralized or any places where the seams didn't quite seem to fit together. But I, I thought this this needed to be addressed. Um, next month's video, if I can get the sources that I need, are also going to be on a World War II related topic. So um, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.